Christmas record, I always think of, you know, in Shrek, the fairy godmother, Is it on? Is it on? <laughs> I keep needing the phone. <laughs> I did it a million times earlier last summer. So you got the Adrian Law. Mm hmm. Okay. Are you saving us out of what? Follow the format of the agenda. Here's <laughs> job. So I'll, I like, can't read. Um, <laughs> that's not going to stop me because I can't read. What up? We're actually 19. I've never had how to read. That's true, we are 19. Shit. I'm soon to not be. Oh, yeah, well. How'd you feel having lived through two world wars? Brand spanking new. <laughs> Fit as a fiddle. Okay. Um. This is the first video one you've done. How could I have done a video on the camera and it should be on Zoom call with oh, you? I don't know. Maybe you have done that. <laughs> no. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Did the girl define smile? Oh. I want the hero they think I will be. 
And yet these arms of mine freeze, shy away from what they want, hopes that are burning to be realised, vicious desire burning from wounds that never seem to disappear. Yet that doesn't stop me from wanting the forbidden contact with you. These endless arms, races of hearts, I need mine. They are not enough. I am always wanting more, wanting, anything to hold back the images that haunt me of you and I. And if you would disappear now, I'd let you go with that backwards glance, to show them I hold more value than what I gain from you. Oh God, I don't know how to be grateful for the blessings I've been given. My will can be broken over and over. And if salvation might come to me on unfamiliar winds, well, I'd come to settle on baby steps for progress. Just be my little helper, my aid. I'd fall at the altar of any woman just to see a new dawn, be it foul or my same dull lover, hell, anything. I need somebody I do not know. Somebody who saves me, an angel to treat me like I'm special, right, just, or even, no, fine, nothing much. But I need them to erase your arms. Loving is surplus. Just keep me pet at arm's length to hold faithful. I don't need them to care for me. I need to sleep tight without the dreams. And I, I don't know why I need your, no. I need to replace your space. But I remember those tender lips, the arms that wanted to hold me together. I was safe when I was scared. But I'm right. I left nothing with you. What do you think? A little back. A little <laughs> Well, I thought it was quite an interesting concept because uh, I'm not going to lie, I'm not that well read. But um, <laughs> but you are well, well listened, no? That's the, the correct word. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> if, if you like, um, I never really come across a concept of taking a song and sort of responding to it in that way. I mean, I don't read a lot of poetry, but I thought it was an interesting thing to do to take the lyrics from a song and move them around, you know, and add to it. So it's like it's almost like the poet was um, like filling in the gaps from the song because obviously for radio recording songs you know poetry doesn't usually work in a song because you know they like to be repetitive and be catchy. I mean, a lot of poetry isn't catchy. Um, so it's like they were filling in the gaps from what the song could have said yeah. if they had longer or you know if it wasn't the song. Yeah I was going to say I completely agree. I, I really like um, the way it's used, the song in, intermingled, um, and in a way, sort of, I think it's using another kind of brief on top of it, another kind of obstacle or parameter mm -hmm. to have to, the, vo the vocabulary, the vocabulary of the song, sort of intermingled. I, I, it's something I quite like to do. I think because um, it just helps guide you again. Like I've done personally, I try to sort of re rework a Bob Dylan song by using a similar sort of rhythm to the song in the poem. I found that was really useful just to help guide it. Mm, Bob Dylan. <laughs> Me and Bob, like this. Um, but as for the poem itself, I think it was a really touching poem um, and really personal in the sense yeah. that the emotion is really clear and really vivid. It's the kind of hatred where you want to hate and keep hating, but you keep bringing yourself back, which then leads to sort of a hatred of oneself and like a particularly vicious cycle, uh, which I'm sure many people have experienced or can sort of identify with. Um, but the most touching line, I think, is so simple but really effective that, oh God, I don't know how to be grateful for the blessings I've been given. That really stuck out to me because it's always a, it's always a desire for blessing, to be blessed. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just, just blessings are there and it's... Taking things for granted. Exactly. And erase your arms, loving is surplus. That was really an interesting line that they don't even want someone to replace them. They just want someone to erase the previous. Mm -hmm. They can be worse in terms of loving, but it's just... The, just the, the distancing from the previous. Uh, yeah, the poem with intense heartbreak and a, a really, really a joy to read. Thank you so much for Kit for sending it in. Right, what have we got? Me, I, I believe you. I've got to find it. Eva is not I a professional bird, but she didn't print out things like a chin. Um, Ruin the rainforest like I did for every show. Oh, of I'm saving the environment, you know, most of the time. Uh, right, yes, we have some haikus now. I like a haiku. Mm -hmm. To me, haikus are. They're on my printer. One sec, I need to go get them. <laughs> Speaking of my printer! I'm cool and professional. Honestly. You didn't see that, that didn't happen.
Chris don't want to shoot with it. Hulk out. It is fine. Okay, I'll I'll cut it out. What? <laughs> so professional. Alright, here we have uh, Andy Freeman. This is nepotism. <laughs> Anna, Anna Freeman? At all. What is this her? your twin? You're into the woo? Is my uncle my twin? <laughs> into the woo? No. <laughs> no, it's my uncle and I'm very grateful for him sending it in. I'm reading them all. How can you have nepotism if I read them all out? Oh, whatever. <laughs> Are you sure this isn't you sending this in? And yeah. It's the same initials. Yeah. And the same first two letters. And his... Well, my brother has the same initials as his wife. Wow. Oh, spooky. Spooky. <laughs> Quinky dink. Me think? Me <laughs> think not. <clears throat> right, yes. Haiku. I like haikus, but I do think they're weird. It's like a concept. Mm. I don't know why. It's because they're probably because they're not designed to rhyme. Yeah. And they can seem like just three sentences, just random sentences, but obviously they do have the five seven five yeah. syllable pattern. But um, I didn't quite I quite enjoyed these uh, haikus. And the reference to Ten Things I Hate About You, which is an excellent film. Uh, I just <laughs> read out my first line of notes. <laughs> 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 it is a good film. I really like the title. The reference to the film. Yeah, Timmy of the Shoe, of course. Of course. I do love a 90s Shakespeare weird teen adaptation. Yeah, exactly. Um, she's the man. She's the man. Oh, this is a bit of a different thing. Oh, but yes. But um, is excellent as well. Right. I've chosen my four favourite haikus out of the ten, just because who can be bothered to read the rest? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I had a feeling. to only read a few. Um, this one is called Cambridge. I think you can guess why I chose this one. Will you be punting today, sir? Blazers Sco I don't know how to pronounce that. Scudamore? Scudamore. I don't think it really matters. Scudamore. Will you be punting today, sir? <laughs> it's a three-line haiku. You can't read it. <laughs> I can read out biological principles in front of biology classes, but I can't read the words. Sir, <laughs> just start again with Cambridge. Cambridge. Will you be punting today, sir? Blazers, Scudamore, pimps, disturb my riverside stroll. This one cracked me up because I could just imagine it. I've been to Cambridge. <laughs> the moment you pause and seem like any kind of tourist, look down, just hesitate. Will you be punting today, madam? Will you be punting today, sir? We also have a competition to see. <laughs> we don't endorse that. <laughs> um, I was, we also do a competition a bit like. Not I spy, but the first one to get offered punting wins a tenner. I will never punt. I've never punted <laughs> my life. I do feel a bit sorry for the pun punters, punterers, punties, punties, scudamores. Forced um, punt. Yeah, I do think it's probably quite chilly, especially in the winter months, which I mm. offer. And nobody wants to punt. And so nobody wants to punt apart from the, the um, <laughs> unknown tourists who yeah. just throw into a boat. Mm. Just get forced. No, yeah, punting. It's not for me. I'll canoe, but <laughs> canoe for like won't punt. I'll kind of, I think I try punting though with the actual stick. No, because it looks like absolute torture. It's so difficult, but you have to do it like in the right way. Apparently, it's not that difficult if you do it in the right angle. But of course, I didn't know. I'm going to just the Venetians, to be honest. If it's the Venetians of the Scudamores. Yeah, they can do that. They can punt for me. The second one is Just Walliams. David Walliams, patronising, lazy prose, banned from bookshops. I absolutely love that. This one cracked me up because yes. I've never liked David Williams, but hang on. If you're listening, David. I'm sorry, but um, Little Britain was never my sort of comedy. <laughs> you think you'd be rich enough, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Plus, I don't think. I think they should have put more on the dress on about 10 years ago because while I was watching it, it was almost archaic. It was really weird. That's oh, interesting. Because they did a series of it, didn't they? They yeah, did. Yeah, they did. Yeah, but it was almost like this message they're trying to send. And also, there's like. Everyone's talking about Jamie on that moment. It was almost too late. It was really, I don't know, because I think the book came out a while back. Yeah. So like, what, too late to be progressive, you mean? Yeah, basically. It was like, would have been progressive if they put it on 10 years ago, but it was like the idea of a boy in a dress, maybe to, I don't know if it's just our generation now, maybe mm. so, not my parents. So I, that's not particularly mind blowing. Mm. So I was like, yeah, and. 
So <laughs> So it didn't have the desired effect no. or like shock or anything like that. No. That's interesting. But then that's just a do my podcast. Um make your own mind. <laughs> yeah. Of course we don't endorse or have any views about the Other are available. So other plays are available. Uh, so that was just on that one. Next time can we go? Yes. Uh, the next one I chose was Onset of Dementia. Who am I? Who are you? Sadly, relentlessly, the answer is the same. I really like yeah, that I one. Yeah, I like that one. It felt, even though they're all three lines, they're mm. all brief, this one felt the most brief. Probably because relentlessly is only one word, but it yeah. has so many syllables, that's why it ticks up the line. Well, they felt like an actual, it sort of felt complete more than the other ones. Like, it felt like a, you didn't need more of a poem. It's like, it was perfectly compact. Yeah. It's all short but sweet. Like a segment, yeah. Yeah. Like a snapshot of la- of the life, but you know that this will be repeated again and yeah. again by a sort of very nature. Not, yeah. not, not saying like an intermission to a goldfish at all, but like that sort of the snapshot and then the sort of tragic cut off yeah. and then it happening again. Yeah. I always think of afterlife, I think, as well, when he goes to visit his um, mm. grandfather who has, I think, dementia or Alzheimer's. And he just has to end up asking sort of the similar yeah. questions again. And it's who are you? Where's Lisa? But Lisa's been dead for, for yeah. months now. And he, so he has to say she's dead every time he goes to see yeah. her. So it's that sort of relentlessness of it, which is really, really tragic, but a really good haiku. Yeah. And well, And the last one lazy schoolboys. Killing time, wasting their divine lives, denigratory. Right. The reason I like this one, although you were. Less keen. Well, yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's weird, weird that I, I, it wasn't my favourite, but then you immediately picked it out. So. Yeah, well, it's because it does remind me of Time by Pink Floyd, oh, right. which is about sort of waiting for your life to begin, waiting for someone to tell you what to do, yeah. and then eventually realising that you know, no one's going to tell you what to do, and you've wasted so much time doing in like a limbo period nothing yeah, yeah which is something i relate to <laughs> <clears throat> well i think lots of people relate to especially the millennials that don't follow this the, the yeah. linear track of secondary school immediately into university immediately into job immediately yeah. into rest of your life i'll read out the first um what's it, stanza um paragraph from the time which sort of, which is what it reminded me of um Ticking away the moments that make up a dull day, fritter and waste the hours in an offhand way, kicking around on a piece of ground in your hometown, waiting for someone or something to show you the way. Mm. And then it just goes on about that. And then at the end, it's like, um, it's talking about you. You are young and life. You are young and life is long, and there is time to kill today. Then one day you find ten years have got behind you. No one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. Ah. So that's just sort of. And I like the Floyd, so this is why. Sort of but the vacation is going Yeah. Thing, yeah. So I was like, I hope I'm still going to miss the starting gun. <laughs> <laughs> Panic. <laughs> but then even if you do quite quite miss the starting gun, you can pick it up, I think, throughout yeah. your life that you have stories of people who are in jobs that they hate for mm. 20 years and discover their passion and they want to yeah. pick that up. And even though they, they did lose that time, it's still precious to pick it up when you yeah. can. So it's not, it can never be too late, really, I don't think. Yeah. Unless if you've got a very short time, like mm-hmm. you're yeah, 85 and pick up a new skill, maybe, mm-hmm. but even then, I guess. But so it's just uh, my uh, favourite haiku is there. Thank you so much, Andy, for sending them mm-hmm. in. The next poem is by Juliet Firth and it's called Experimentation. What colour should I become now? How can I do an experiment in chromatography? I repeat this aloud to my grey tinged reflection in the hazy monochrome of my colourful projections. Shall I be blue? Blue so bright it becomes a salt or a moody midnight blue. Or a midnight moody blue, sorry. Black and blue. No. Or how about green? How will I be seen then? As a jaded field or a murky weed cluttered sea of sick jealousy? No. Today I am red. Not just ladybird red or poppy crimson, but an angry red. Hate red. The ultimate visual offender, head to toe in bloody agenda. But red equals power a sort of rebellion, and so I get dressed and become powerful. And my first thought about this, I don't know why I thought about it, was in the meme of the secondary school teacher, where the story says the curtains were blue and the teacher yeah. has a breakdown. Mm-hmm. I thought of that because sometimes when you think about colour symbolism, you essentially to that. Blue, sad, red, mm-hmm. anger. But I think this stretches out the colours beyond just their simple yeah. abstractions and shows the variety of associations colours mm-hmm. can have, because yellow can mean 
sickness, it can mean spring, mm -hmm. all these sorts of things. Well, yeah, and they're also different colours and different connotations and different cultures. And exactly. Stuff. So, a white lily mean death in the UK, but mm -hmm. it might mean something else. I can not they asked from the culture. I think yeah. there's definitely some flowers where one is complete positive, one is a complete negative association. Yeah. Um, I think the base layer of monochrome is interesting with the colourful projections onto it. In quite a sad way, but interesting that it's only the outward layers that show the mm -hmm. colour and vibrancy, and it's our base level. A bit like the NPC meme. Is that the one where it's just like a blank screen, mm -hmm. and then you place outwardly what you want to show to other people, the colourful projections. And um, the colour linking to emotion and the way you present yourself, I think is interesting. How yeah. will I be seen then is really interesting. It could be a comment on how so many people are judged not only for what they wear and the colours that they wear, but the colours, quote unquote, of their personality mm. and how they choose to present themselves. And um, like I said, it investigates a full spectrum of colours. Red can be dainty, cute, delicate in the way of ladybird red mm. or poppy, but so fine and delicate. But it can also be angry, hateful, and a bloody agenda sort of tops off the violence to, that, yeah. to what red can really symbolise. And the ending, I'm, bit, I'm quite a fan of the ambiguous ending, and yeah. I think this one has it as well. It can be positive or negative. Well, yeah, my favourite bit about this poem was that last stanza, that ending. Mm. Because I just like how it ended with the word powerful, because you know, that made it a powerful ending in itself. Yep, like that one. And it's no, there's no full stop, there's no yeah. anything else. Powerful is the final that message. But I think that, because that, in the final stanza, it's talking about using the two, the, talks about using the tools at their disposal to rebel. But a part of me sort of still finds it sad that the persona can't feel powerful without the clothing, without the mm -hmm. front, but they get dressed to become powerful. Is the grey, can grey not be powerful? Mm -hmm. Can monochrome still not be powerful? Um, so I think this plays with society's connotations of colour and how they link to emotion and emotional representation. So really, really interesting thought provoking poem. Thank you so much, Juliet, for sending it in. And the next poem is Why You Ought to Vote Yes to Keep Hate In by Greg Mill. Which is a very interesting title. I think when I read that I was like, oh, <laughs> but yes oh, to keep yeah. hate in. I mean like a punchy title. So yeah, that's good. There's been a lot of talk of late from people who are quite unwise who say we should abolish hate. Believe me, it's a pack of lies. A pack of lies, that's what it is. A pack of lies, I'll tell you straight. My words won't skid, my words won't slip, nor will I want to prevaricate. The hatred which concerns me now, the hatred I will soon defend, is something that cannot be found without practice for years on end. It takes tremendous discipline to work and build this kind of hate, the toil is often dull and grim and takes up most of the waking day. It's practice on our phones and laptops, it's practice when we watch TV, it's practice when we read the red tops and practice through the family tea. This talent must be cultivated until it's taught and poised to pounce. At any sign of motivation, it springs, then watch it fly around. Much like the noblest oh god <laughs> rhetoricians. Much like the noblest rhetoricians who would stir themselves with artful tricks, they're conscious of our uh, affectation whilst watching hatred soar and split. This nimble, sly, dexterous state is nothing but a force for good. It helps us find our certain shape through finding those we wish to shun. We're soon in years. <laughs> is that what in years? I don't know. In years. You don't have to say the French accent. In years. In years. I just say French. I just put words I don't know into French accents for no reason at all. We're soon in years to criticism, and soon we found a group of friends who see the world through the same prison, and now at last we're one of many, who hate and love the same as us, with whom our passions can be shared. This shared desire to loathe and crush our enemies can't be compared. To any other rhapsody, it's felt in footfalls, chants and cries, and felt in marches, songs and rallies. Hate swells us with the heat of pride. And yet, deep down, we know it's fake, that all this hatred is but a mask. And this is what makes it safe, as threatening as an anti-mask. And so, why throw this hate away? To do so would be just myopic. It keeps us in a stable state and it's absolutely would be catastrophic. It would be swift, sage, to add to this balance. It would be swift, sage, to add that this balance is deft, dainty and a son of a bitch to master, flip, flap, fall in your floundering arms are deep in hatred that catches, claws, clings until you can't, just can't escape it. This is no placid play, it is a thing which sings, cold, cruel, of the vast violence which is within the flame flickered fuel, and the ruin, wreckage, roaring, raising, is it wrath or wrath? <laughs> 
feel with what you feel. Wrath. Wrath. It's a great to wrath, but that looks like wrath. I don't know if they're different words or not. Whatever. Um, and the ruined wreckage, roaring, raising wrath and deep destruction. Truth is born from fallen fiction. I'm sorry about that, my tongue just slipped. If I were you, I'd pay no mind. And remember, vote to keep hate in, and don't believe those monstrous lies. How do you find the tongue twisters? Blue. Actually, they weren't that bad. <laughs> they're definitely, you definitely think what you're saying as you're saying them, because you're trying to put yeah, your mouth Yeah, but they're words. not, the words themselves aren't that close mm, together, so. Mm. Like, claws, cleans, catches, I mean, it's, it's not going to trip me up. <laughs> I mean, it almost did just then, but. Yeah, <laughs> let no, I'm really joking. And this is a, another biting, quite mm. biting but funny poem from Greg. Um, if you listen to our um, first episode, episode one, um, Kurt and Captain Glass, he won that episode with his poem, um, The Adventures of Buying a Home in the Country, I think. And this is, as usual, a very intelligent, very good poem from Greg. Um, you can see Greg's tone of speaking and writing coming through, which I think is really interesting. Sort of slightly formalised dialogue with a healthy touch of irony, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, and I love how he used the brief to defend hatred is certainly not the first thing that would, you'd come to, that would come to mind when dealing with the prompt. But he does so in such a way that it shows the funny side, the satisfying side of finding people that you sort of can become us against the world, that sort mm -hmm. of idea. And um, the in interesting bit talking about how the absence of hate would be catastrophic and it makes you think how cathartic it can be to hate certain things, certain figures like Marmite or I think I like Piers Morgan that is so mm. universally hated by a big group and it feels nice to sort of rant about it, something like that, it gets it off your chest, um, which I think is yeah. can be a good thing. Um, and I love the shattering and the penultimate stanza with the tongue twisters. Yeah. Um, another aspect of literary craft, another sort of brief to, uh, or an obstacle to put in tongue twisters and words that are similar mm. to try and trick the reader's tongue and the, or the right, the, yeah, the reader's tongue. The falafel before poem. Exactly. <laughs> Falafel for Yeah, it's falafel or something. That was a falafel, falafel, I don't even know. It's in German. <laughs> falafel, the book. Do any more comments on that? So, thank you so much, Greg, as usual, for sending it in. So, our next entry is by Sophie Braun, and it's called The Story of Why I Hate Pickled Eggs. Another amazing title, I think. So, The Story of Why I Hate Pickled Eggs by Sophie Braun. To be read in the style of a teenage drama queen. Um, to my best. <laughs> stage directions. <laughs> yeah. Let's think of Angus Thorns and Perfect Snogging, that yeah. sort of style. So, let me tell you a little story. It's Christmas, 2K14. Which I absolutely love following, 2K14. <laughs> NBA, 2K14. And my idiot brother Jimmy keeps bounding to the bedroom at like 9am. I know why. 9am. Because he not noticed it's the school holidays. Only reason I want to be waking up early than midday in the school holidays is if I'm boarding a plane somewhere with a different time zone. You get me? And I barely even open my eyes and he's jumping up and down and screaming and it's like, Hello, you're eight years old, not five. Get over it already. I'm about to kick him out, but then mum and dad come in waltzing in like my room is some kind of public property and they're wearing these big phony smiles and the most hideous Christmas jumpers I've ever seen. Like just looking at them makes me want to hurl. I can feel the bile rising in my throat just thinking about it now. And just when I think it can't get any worse, I look down at Mum's hands and, like, I could have actually fainted. I literally could have. Literally. And I would have been in my bed too, so it wouldn't have been that bad. Because I see in her hands, she's holding two more matching Christmas jumpers. Like, literal shudders. And just when I'm thinking the day couldn't get any worse, Aunt Aggie and Uncle Brian show up with their stupid baby. And everyone's all crying around to get a look at it and going on about how cute it is. Except I don't think it looks cute at all. I think it looks ugly, just like all babies look ugly. They look like people, but just smaller and redder and wrinklier, which is also what Grandpa looks like and nobody goes around calling him cute. So when I tell Aunt Aggie this, she just smiles and pinches my cheeks and says, she remembers when I used to be cute too. And she laughs like this is literally the funniest thing anyone has ever said. And then Uncle Brian starts laughing too, because that's what slightly balding, sweater vest wearing, middle-aged men do when their wife tells them something is funny. So anyway, I'm sitting on the sofa, watching the stupid baby stare at our grandmother clock like it's the latest English dubbed Scandinavian thriller. Like every time the pendulum stops to swing back the other way, it's like literally the greatest plot to discover. And part of me just wants to lean in and whisper into his ear that it's about to stop and swing back the other way just to spoil it for him. But instead, I see an opportunity, being the intellectual prodigy that I am. So I pick up the baby and place him on my lap and like, rock him slightly. 
and whisper at him to go to sleep over and over again until his stupid baby brain finally gets the message. So then, when Mum walks in like five minutes later to ask for my help setting the table, I'm all like, oh gee Mum, I'm so so sorry, like utterly devastated. I've just got the sleeping baby away right now. You know how much I love babies, so I'm gonna afraid I'm gonna be able to help you and my inner assistant right now regarding the table setting situation. And Mum totally laps it up like the sap that she is and says she'll get Jimmy to help instead, so that's a total victory to me in my amazing creative mind. But I don't get to enjoy the victory for long because just when I'm thinking this day could possibly get any worse, Grandpa comes in and sits next to me and I'm like, for God's sake, my brilliant and inspired plan has just totally backfired. So now I'm trapped next to this dinosaur while Top of the Pops is on and to listen to his stream of bigoted commentary. And if I try and call him out on it, he'll just roll his eyes and chuckle, like being racially tolerant is some kind of teenage phase I'll eventually grow up. That's it, I'm lucky enough not to listen. That's it, I'm lucky. Lucky to do a contentious word. That's if I'm lucky enough not to have listen. That's if I'm lucky enough not to have to listen to him tell the story of the time he got to some guy called Eddie Cochran literally the hundred billionth time. Like no one knows who that actually is, Grandpa. No one listens to any music that came out before 1982 anymore. There was literally no good music before then. So anyway, it's dinner time, and I tried to put the baby back in its pram without waking him, but obviously the minute his head hits the surface, it's actually intended to be slept on. His eyes fly open, and he starts weighing his head off like. Oh, babies are so loud and annoying, why do they even exist? And I try to leave him there because I don't want my Christmas dinner ruined, but then Aunt Aggie brings him in anyway with her, which is totally not fair. Like her eardrums are probably already permanently damaged from having to lip that thing, it's not fair to inflict that on the rest of us. So anyway, we've eaten dinner, and Lana is hovering over Jimmy, Jimmy's shoulder waiting for him to finish. Practically cheering him on so she can whisk the plates away and finish the washing up for the Queen's speech. Even though she already made me set up her DVD plan to record it for her like three weeks ago, just in case. The baby's cries are reduced to these old gurgles which make it sound like it's choking on its own disgustingness. And Grandpa is like, the pickled eggs. Why are my pickled eggs? Because apparently according to Grandpa it's like some kind of tradition that have to have pickled eggs after Christmas dinner or a Sunday roast or literally any meal involving meat. So Mum hands them over and I briefly get to enjoy watching him struggle to open it for a few minutes. Like his face turns proper bright red when he starts making these same gurgling noises as the baby. But then Uncle Brian goes and ruins it by offering to open it for him. Total buzzkill. Then he takes the jar and goes out of the room like a jar, like opening a jar of pickled eggs is as efficiently taxing and demanding job that simply has to be taken to a different room in order to be accomplished. And then just when I think this day couldn't get any worse, Aunt Aggie settles into the best seat on the sofa, my seat, and plops the baby onto her lap, clearly plagiarizing my genius idea from earlier. And Nana settles down next to her, so on going on about how the Queen's speech will be starting soon, like watching some old rich lady talk for 15 minutes is literally the single most important event of her entire life. So I'm stuck next to Grandpa again, who somehow has still managed to fall asleep despite the constant stream of noise coming from literally every square inch of this house. Like honestly, the man is a scientific marvel. There should be studies conducted and papers written about this man and his ability to just lose consciousness at will. And like, as I'm staring at him, I can see this line of drool is beginning to make its way down his chin. And it's on track to land right on my shoulder, but I'm powerless to do anything to stop it. They're the only tools I have to prevent it on my hands. And I would rather have disgusting grandpa on this disgusting sweater rather than on my poor, unprotected hands. And right at that moment, just as the jaw is preparing to make it epically across the wrap from chin to shoulder, just when I'm thinking this date literally can't get any worse, Dad walks in and he turns to Mum and he says, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. And he takes off the disgusting, hideous Christmas jumper and he hands it to her. And she just stares down at it like it's a dead dog he's just hit with a car or something. And then he turns to me and Jimmy and he says, I promise I'll see you guys soon. And then he just leaves. Like, straight out the front door. Like, he doesn't even stop to say goodbye to anyone. Like, we are not rose with manners. And everyone just looks around each other, like, someone tends to be trying to read each other's faces and we're not making eye contact, and they're all quiet. Even the baby has finally stopped crying. They only sound just the queen blabbing them on TV, like, no one bothered to give her the memo. And I think, hallelujah! I guess that's what it took to get everyone to finally shut up. And I turn to mum, and she's looking like she wants to cry, but I can't quite remember how to. And she's still staring at that jumper. That stupid, hideous jumper. I'm just talking about it. And now I can feel the bile rising in my throat again, it was so disgusting. And then I turned to Jimmy and he's like, you have to be ears crying. And it's like, hello, you're eight, not five, pull yourself together. And then right at that moment, Uncle Brian walks in and he's all cheering and smiling and holding that stupid pickled eggs jar off his head like it's some kind of prize. And he goes, I finally got the lid off! Like that's the single witchest thing any balding, sweater bed wearing middle-aged man has ever accomplished. And I just want to scream at him, can't you see that no one cares? 
Like you said, it doesn't matter anymore, nothing matters anymore because the single most important man in my life has just left and he's never coming back in my entire life. I know that it's been ruined and all this while I'm wearing the most stupid, disgusting, itchy jumper ever. So now my outsides feel scratched and red and raw and my insides feel scratched and red and raw and this is this moment, right this very second, is quite possibly literally the worst moment of my entire life. So yeah, anyway, that's the story of why I hate pickled eggs. Be careful. I certainly wasn't expecting that ending, and I think I almost fainted from lack of breath there, but I felt like it needed it to have like the and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Because you could sort of yeah. feel it piling up. But I was thinking I'm not I'm always a fan of using like 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 colloquial language mm -hmm. or even some sort of accent or diction that is stereotyped to be not as intelligent because you think yeah. teenagers like literally oh my god, literally oh my god that sort of those sort of fillers uh, sort of automatically thought of as although saying something dumb, inconsequential. But I think it's interesting when you play with that, then, then they still say some really profound things. Yeah. Like it made me think of um, one of my favourite bits, strangely, in Stranger Things, is when Hopper says something along the lines of something like, I don't know, I feel like I'm sort of sort of black hole or something, uh, and he sort of just sort of tries to play it down and use just sort of all these colloquial sort of things. Mm -hmm but the sentiment he uses is still really powerful. Yeah. And so you don't need to have the traditional sugar-coated language like high register, mm -hmm. crystal clear pronunciation to still have something, to give it an emotional impact. Which I, I, and I said, I've written, you can just imagine this famous scene, and your songs in perfect song, because you can. You can just make how many picture it, like the small in, in, inconsequential things that just grate on her, and then the straw that breaks the camel's back is something that's so important, but then also, she gets, well, it seems to me she gets similarly pulled apart over having to wear a jumper. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, what do you think? I think the wild charm. <laughs> yeah, although they're sort of teenage type yeah. films. Oh, it's little things and then they're very important to the person. Yeah. And you didn't think we were using colloquialisms or like um, incorrect grammar, it still gets the point across. Exactly. It's yeah. not everyone talks. You know, or hoity toity. Or barely anyone does, do well, Yeah, so it's like, it's more personal in a way, because I mean, I guess having very high sort of. If there's a like, very. Um, there's a lot of vocabulary that you didn't understand and it's hard to connect with it, but everyone understood that. It just goes to use. Those poop language that everybody uses. Yeah. So you have a tighter connection to it. Mm. I hope you could understand what I was saying. I thought yeah. maybe I didn't go too fast. It's all right. <laughs> for me to speak some mother minute, I feel like I had to go quite hell. But yes, thank you so much, Sophie, for sending it in a really uh, insightful, really interesting monologue. And then the last one, uh, a personal fave. <laughs> I must admit, I do love this one, and everyone I've shown it to so similarly absolutely loves it. So, yeah, well, yes, creatively titled. Uh, <laughs> Tucci Thang, and for those who don't know, it's about the man called Stanley Tucci, the actor who played Wait. Caesar in the Hunger Games. Yeah, the Hunger Games. He's, He's been in all sorts of things. He was in um, he was Puck as well, wasn't he? In the Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm -hmm. uh, He's one of those actors where you're like, I've seen him. He's been in loads of things. Yeah. That sort of. That sort of. Oh, S. there he is again. Mm -hmm. I can't. What's his name again? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, he did go viral for making a Negroni <laughs> a few weeks ago. I should do. I know. Right, let's try and get through this without <laughs> tripping her up. <laughs> this is uh, Tucci Thang by Rebecca Sun. Tucci Thang. I feel like it's quite a highbrow. <clears throat> there isn't a man I hate more on this earth than Stanley Tucci, well, for what it's worth. Let me tell you a story that will leave a bad taste, for it's wretched and sorry and it's written with haste. But a year ago I walked out on the street when I spied Stan himself carrying shopping to eat. He was smaller than expected, a little older too, and he gave me a look that nearly rent me in two. It said, don't say it, so I didn't speak a word. I simply pretended the thought hadn't occurred. He trotted quickly past, thinking he was scot-free, but I turned to my mother and said, wasn't that the man Tucci? We weren't quite sure, but he wasn't like his pictures, but in the end we decided that that was... These were just scriptures. Not five minutes had passed when out of the blue a massive bug into my sclera flew. 
I screamed out in pain, but twas quite an eyeful. I tell you these beetles, they're really no trifle. Finally we extracted their ominous beast, jet black, six mean legs, and an inch long at least. And I squinted through my eye, I thought it had occurred, but I tried to dismiss it. Surely this was absurd. But the longer I contemplated that snarky grin, but the more I convinced I became. By God, it was him! I had seen old Stan in his truest form, and now I must pay with an insect swarm. So ever since that day, I tell you, I've been hounded by flies who attempt to have me confounded. Now, you did ask me who do I truly hate most. Well, my friend, it's quite simple. No one can, else can come close. Lo, on clear nights like these, I hold off my hand by Gucci and cry out, Fury, thy name is Stanley Tucci. <laughs> it's just impeccable, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, there's so many cracking lines. The best one for me is, because I've just thought, what can I run for Tucci? My hand by Gucci. <laughs> I found a tea on my bag! Oh, I found a tea on my bag! Uh, like, yeah, my favourite is the more, well, the more convinced I became, my god, it was me! <laughs> like, I saw Stan in his truest form. <laughs> she uses quite like, like, using like low and mm. fury and, yeah, my god, it was him. Taking the mick, I think, is it? Yeah, it's, like, it's very, you know, archaic language a little bit. <laughs> it's very in the um, style of obviously classic Doctor Zeus mm. and that sort of like just the rhyming skate pattern on that one. It was, it was, I love a good rhyme. <laughs> it's sort of like it's like a light-hearted version of Kafka's Metamorphosis, <laughs> <laughs> turning into a beetle just to get vengeance on someone who sees you. Yeah, shopping. But about the poem itself, I thought when I read it, I just thought because I said I didn't. People shouldn't feel the need to go too dark. Yeah. And so I really love this kind of poem because it's like the sort of joking hatred. Like yeah. I said before, everyone loves to hate like mm. a bug flying in your eye, just sort of silly things like that. Which captures yeah, the sort of joking kind of the hatred. <laughs> but just tell me too cheap to do to you. <laughs> well, I think she, she did tell me this is a true story. <laughs> so <laughs> sadly <laughs> So watch out. <laughs> but, don't say a word. <laughs> don't say a word. And the sort of jumping between the thoughts, I think, yeah. really sort of the staccato rhythm really helps like solidify, solidify the jokes. Like you could always imagine someone like a comedy club, club comedy club, like crack up a little ukulele. Yes. Yeah. But, but yeah, like these classic, you know, when you read a poem and like I don't know if it's like a stylistic choice, but some of the rhymes don't quite work. Yeah. So like half rhymes, but the one that cracked me up was having to say to chi <laughs> to get it to rhyme. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. Which book was that? Um, oh, it was yeah. called Free. Wasn't that man Tucci? Because <laughs> Tucci doesn't quite rhyme properly. It was like, that man Free? Tucci. <laughs> See you, Rebecca. Thank you so yeah. much. I said, what's my Tickle the fancy quite a lot. But now on to the winning entry of the show. And like I said, Drum roll. Drum roll. I'm going to give a little speech first. Okay. Um, like I said before, these are, we always get amazing submissions and I'm literally blown away every single week by not just the quality of the work and not just the sort of the length of the work, if that makes sense, because I know we only give you like a week and a half to do it, but just the variety of different things people can send in, the variety of tones, sort of like levels, all sorts of things that like you have a sort of the joking way of using like the low and all that stuff mm -hmm. and you've got Sophie's which had intentionally used literally oh my god the worst thing ever and you have Greg's which uses like a more formalised type register which I think also ties into sort of like political language mm -hmm. that all that sort of jargon so even within that it's just so many levels of just different voices um, so once again thank you so much to everyone who sent in submissions yes. but there can be only one winner and I'm very pleased to announce it is Jean-Michel Morg with Poor Poor, an amazing poem. Um, I think what we thought about this was, even when you're reading it, you mm. thought, I don't quite understand it the first time, but you just know it's so good. It just felt so well-crafted. Yeah, it felt like an epic poem. Because yeah. <laughs> well, he said that um, it's unfinished, and it definitely reminds me of those really long epic poems that just sort of just keep going. Mm. Definitely sort of what it could become, but it's so well crafted. Even you, you know, yeah. you know every single line because they're so personal. Every single line is of so much importance, mm -hmm. and it ties into so many different contexts that we probably weren't aware of on the first reading. But yeah. then at the second and third reading, it requires research. Yeah, 
which is which is good in its way, isn't it? It's not just for like it's not on a shallow level. It's on a much like a really deep level, really really interesting and poignant. Um, so thank you so much, Jean Michel, for sending it in. It was a delight to read, and um, thank you so much for sharing it with us. Hello, Anna and Ava. Thanks so much for having me on the show. My name is John Michael, or just Jam for short. I'll be reading my poem today called Popo. Uh, for some context, uh, I'm half Taiwanese, half French, and Popo is how we called my Taiwanese maternal grandmother in Mandarin. She unfortunately died in the middle of Lent in February, and I've actually been learning a lot about her life since then, uh, a lot of things I didn't know beforehand. Uh, she really was an extraordinary woman. Uh, and this is a poem about her life, about an extraordinary change from so much hate to so much love, and what type of person it takes to bring about that change, paralleled by the linguistic, political, and cultural changes happening on the island of Taiwan during the time she was growing up. So, uh, here's my poem. Po Po. I would like to say that this poem is not finished. Like life, like love. It will continue writing itself with the changing shades in time. Popo. Grand Ma is a skeleton dried up portmanteau. To me, it was always Popo, though even that here strangely means. Si he yuan. In the quadrangle courtyard, the constricting space heavy with the press of seventeen children, some older brothers, some ghosts of older sisters, she was born. Some jumble jangling gluck, unfamiliar to their rugged ears, had told Okasan and Otosan to feed and clothe the consequence of pastime, because you cannot sell your daughters any more. The last, the youngest, drowned profound in sleep, was roused amidst the whipping whistle Gun, beating her into consciousness, was then frozen petrified by the lightning ravaged shower curtain thunder torn to gaping. Mother had come again to find her naked, to beat her naked. Sister went to the tea house where sister learned to have no consequence and never had children again. Mother, in fury, went to fetch her, but saw the steaming bowl of rice crowned with gleaming strings of pork still sizzling. Mother came home alone. Hun. The plum trees bloom midwinter. In the quadrangle, hate festers, self-perpetuating. Small space too much stuffed with life, sprung from the rotten seed, flushed in the veins with putrid liquid, sprouting through cramped shoots of family upon family, withering in hate upon hate upon hate, as the water festers. The rice paddy yields hunger when burdened by a morted life. How sick she must have felt for eating. Lucky days had two, three pickles garnish. Lingering in the air always is the faint hint of Okasan blended in mumbling haka. There is an atmospheric weight to the old, old world. Formosa changed. Popo learned unkenned guo yu that came askance the narrow main in drafts of gusty, breathy wind, blessing vapid o into welkin water. She left school at twelve, home at fourteen, decay reversed in druid magic, stranger than a maiden drifting towards the moon to live forever, she clear gleaming pure as Chang'e full bloomed in the mid-autumn night. She married when she was eighteen and planted herself where the plum trees grow. I. By all accounts, my mother says she grew up in a home that was unwanting in love. My mother, your Popo, gave us all herself entirely, blankets, yelling, garlic, and all. Once we came back from the grocers, and she, arm hands ballooned with vegetables, shoulders mounted with unruly dachocho, slapped the bus lady twice across the face hard for closing the door on us. She spoke Chinese so beautifully, wrote so elegantly. People would call her teacher. Little did they know. She was proud. She was there. You mostly knew her after Ye Ye died, when she was so alive, still so young, your Facebook travel blogging Popo, who commented just too much. She was so happy when she saw you. I don't think you know. 
at the end. It gathered so quick, all that life. She couldn't stand to be a burden to us. Your cousins, your uncles, they were all there day and night. And that's when she did it in the middle of the night when Ching Ching was sleeping there besides. She couldn't stand to be a burden. She was always like that. She had to be to live with too much life, stubborn, so that she birthed so much love from herself that there would be enough to share. I imagine the crimson petals blossoming across the snow-white hospital sheets like plum trees in full bloom. They would have been. It was that time of year. That's why I and La N are far and close. The plum blossoms bloom in vibrant pinks amidst the bleak white winter snow when everything is dead and waiting. Hello everyone, you're listening to Briefed on Cam FM and this is the interview segment of our show. You've just heard John Michael reading his lovely poem and we've got him here with us. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on Anna. Uh, it's great to be here. It's an absolutely, I think if you can all agree, it's an absolutely amazing poem, um, really, really fascinating. So, um, and there's lots of, I think, really poignant lines that I think we'd like to unpick. In particular, I think for me, maybe because it was capitalised, but because it's also just such a punchy line, you cannot sell your daughters anymore. What's the sort of context of that? Yeah, so that was sort of, I guess, um, I guess in, in Taiwan in the 1920s, really, or just sort of all the way up into the 1940s and 50s, even. I think there was a practice of sort of having lots of children and getting rid of the daughters because they would be difficult to upkeep and maintain and they couldn't really work on the farms um, and feed themselves and so that was real practice and so when I was like learning about these stories about my grandmother essentially uh, what happened was that she only really knew four of her sisters I think and there were 17 siblings um, so there must have been maybe 10 or like 11 other sisters um, and uh, they were all sort of sold off um, which was sort of common practice at the time but those sort of the last three or four sisters uh, that weren't sold off was because the laws had changed uh, mm. once the Chinese sort of came onto the, to the island of Taiwan and after the Japanese sort of uh, were removed uh, after the World War II. And, uh, and yeah, so the laws changed. That's why I put it in capital, capitalized uh, font to sort of put it in there. Also, it's supposed to be more striking because another interesting thing is that it's, it's, it's a different language as well because my grandmother grew up speaking Hakka, which was like the local language on the island. But of course, the Chinese would be speaking Mandarin and mm. the people who were ruling the island before then were the Japanese and they'd be speaking Japanese. So, of course, it's supposed to be like a striking, different, strange sounding imposition. Um, <laughs> that is a constraint for the parents, but at the same time uh, was good for my grandmother, I guess. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, another piercing image, I think, is of the rice and the pork. And I was just wondering, why does that stop the mother in her tracks? What's the significance of the rice and pork? Right. Um, so they were very poor. Um, again, you know, it was a household that was, so Chinese households, they lived in these kind of, kind of courtyards, quadrangles called <laughs> Sihuyuan in Chinese. And uh, they were like very poor. And so, you know, a small space really and uh, you had to feed so many people and they were farming, they were farming rice. And so really what you'd eat, the daily staple diet was a small bowl of rice. And uh, now if you go to China you, or any Chinese restaurant, uh, you usually have on your bowl of rice, lots of different uh, flavors and garnish pork, vegetables, um, delicious things, chicken that you can put on. Um, but that back then was a real luxury. So for the grandmother, I mean, this is another story that my mother told me. Uh, essentially, this is about my grandmother's sister, who was sent again to the tea house because she couldn't be sold off. She was sent to the tea house to go make some money, and that uh, the tea house at the time was was a place for prostitution and activities like that. Um, and so uh, she was making money, and and the grandmother or my grandmother's mother wanted to go get the sister back when she sort of realized what she was doing. But then, no, she saw she saw the bowl of rice crowned with strings of pork, gleaming strings of pork still sizzling. And she's like, oh, well, you can stay here then if it means we'll eat a little bit better. And again, like, again, something I tried to do was, was with the language to make it more resting and more, I guess, hypnotic even, um, 
yeah, so just to sort of mimic the effect of how, how strange and marvelous it would have been for them, even though it's just something rather normal for us. Mm. And now, like you mentioned, this is a poem about your family. Um, and in, did you find that writing, crafting the poem sort of brought you closer to them and helped you sort of identify with them, even though the times were so different? Um, well, definitely with my grandmother, I think, uh, even though unfortunately she, she's no longer with us. Mm. Um, I think it, it definitely sort of gave me the impetus because I knew I wanted to write something about her. I knew I didn't really necessarily know. Like I had heard some stories, but I didn't know anything in detail. And so that's when I really consulted my mother to get her to tell me. Um, and that definitely brought me closer with my mother, yes. Um, and it's also sort of helped me appreciate my grandmother as more of a, of a three-dimensional human being as opposed to the, just the one past that I always got to see, you know, cheerful, a little bit annoying, uh, a little bit smelly sometimes, <laughs> would always you know, I want to hug you, want to like grab you, want to make you wake up way too early, you know, didn't let you recover from jet lag. And I was always very loud. And so those are my memories of my good memories, but not, I think, reflective of who she was in her entirety. And that's what I tried to really get to grips with. So yes, I think so. Yes, that's, that's so true. I think with, um, with, my, with my grandma as well, you, like you say, you sort of know her as you know her for those sort of 10 however many years when she when my grandma was in her 80s or late 70s and you sort of forget that their lives was completely different when they were sort of growing up and I remember it was only sort of towards the very end of my grandma's life that I asked her about because she was an evacuee um about that sort of aspect of her life and it was just so different and incredible to learn about and um, so I felt so so privileged to be able to sort of know that about her life um a sentiment that I felt was really poignant in towards the end of your poem was that your grandma or she felt that she, could, she lived with too much life. Would you say the idea of, of balance seems to be important in the poem, that the complex balance of love, hate, life, death, that sort of thing? Yeah, um, if anything, actually, I, there is a balance that I try to strike, trying to find the contrasts between the different elements. So one section is called hate, hun. The other one is called love, I. So that sense needs to be balanced, yes. But, but the more I think about it, the more I, I really felt my grandmother couldn't have been such a balanced character. She needed almost to, to really give so much more of herself in order to escape, I think, that you know, cyclical festering hatred and hatred and hatred, which was really just sort of generation upon generation upon generation down to how my grandmother's own mother sort of abused her and, mm. and those things like that. And, uh, and you know, my grandmother had to be an extraordinary woman in order to, to remove herself from that cycle, really. And, uh, and that's what too much life means. At the same time, when you live with too much life, it can, it can also have its drawbacks, I think. You can, you can be sort of oblivious to what other people say. You can think you're always right. And in a sense, I do think my grandmother was a little bit like that. Um, uh, stubborn, but I think stubborn in the best way. Stubborn in the way that she was able, really, and that's why I use that image, to birth so much love. Um, it's really all coming from herself. And she is like this fountainhead, this spring of love that has transmitted down to my mother and down to me. And without her, none of that would have existed. And so it's a tremendous effort um, that she's had to do too much life. That's what, that's what I would unpick from that word, yeah. Mm, the poem really celebrates that, her life and her living. To sort of draw it out to its wider context, what would you say in the poem, is, in the poem and just generally, is the interplay between the political, you, know, you mentioned Taiwan's transition, and the domestic or cultural? Yeah, so um, Taiwan is a very special place. <laughs> um, a lot of the stuff I was trying to deal with actually in this poem was this idea of, of language. So okasan and otosan are the Japanese ways to call your parents. And that's why I was so shocked. My mother told me that my grandmother called her mother okasan. And I said, that's not how you call mom in Chinese. And she said, no, no, but they were Japanese at the time. Mm. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so language is a big sort of change that's happening. Guoyu is, is what my grandmother learned, that's Chinese. And in the poem, I kind of use it maybe fancifully a little bit, but I like to think so that it, it's, sort of, it's sort of a theme of, of escape. You know, she's escaping out of this Japanese world, of this Hakka old world into this new Chinese world. Of course, the nationalist government at the time was dictatorship and you know, they did all sorts of atrocities as well. But I think for her, it was really a way of escape. You know, it allowed her to meet my grandfather who was in the army. 
at the time. So it wasn't from Taiwan. He was actually from mainland China. He had sort of fled over with the rest of, of the army when they were fleeing the communists. And, and that was really her way of escape. So again, the linguistic change, I think, was really something that allowed her to, to move out of the hatred. It, it came with sort of an emotional change as well. Um, yeah. And, uh, and again, the laws changed, for instance, uh, all sorts of things changed. And then another thing that I really tried to, to think about here was, again, the idea of linguistic change. <laughs> I'm writing a poem in English about, you know, my, my Taiwanese grandmother who, who didn't speak English, didn't read English. Um, so this idea of, of using sort of a language that might not be entirely appropriate to render a three-dimensional portrayal of a person who, who wasn't English. I don't know, it's something I, I kind of struggled with and tried to balance in this poem as well with the use of different words. And the mixture of languages. Well, this is an absolutely fascinating history, a fascinating life. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing her life and all experiences with us um, through brief in a sort of way. Um, just to sort of like a final question. I asked Lewis this last fortnight. Um, I know we're sort of coming out of lockdown a little bit, but lots of us are still at home. Do you have any good book or film recommendations for us? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, the the secret the secret history uh, by by Donna Tartt, um, which is probably the, the first fiction I've read in like a year and a half that hasn't had it with my with my course. <laughs> Um, no, it was really good fun. It's sort of this kind of like murder mystery. It's these students that sort of form a little like classics cult and they want to recreate a bacchanal and they're all at university. It's basically what I imagined Cambridge to be like. <laughs> but do give it a read. It's, it's really, really good fun. Um, and it's really cool. Thank Definitely. You. If you're interested in seeing more of John Michael's work and things he's produced, he is um, alongside others producing a poetry anthology, Voices in Isolation, um, yeah. with Christ's College Poetry Society. So if you're around at the start of term, they're printing off some free copies, pop into Christ's and get a copy. Thank you so much, John Michael, for coming on the show. Yes, thank you so much, Anna. Uh, it was great. Be aware. Turn those notifications off. That's not even me. Oh, <laughs> Tuesday evening, sorry, at Tuesday midnight, just so we can 
have enough time to contact the winner, get the interview sorted, and just to edit the show and things like that. So the deadline date is Tuesday the 11th of August, ready for the show on the 15th. So I think that about wraps it up. Thank you so much, Eva, for coming on the show with such short notice. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's fine. It's a good job on next week, you <laughs> Um, and make sure to join us next fortnight. Not me oh. though. Me and Cameron back on our usual audio format next fortnight for our next brief. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>